Hi, welcome to ABMA's Inside the Boiler Room. I am Shawnika Jason, ABMA's Vice President of Membership and Marketing and the host for this episode. Before we jump into today's topic, I want to recognize for our new followers that our podcast is available on YouTube as well as listened to on most platforms um, through the podcast platforms. National STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, and STEAM, which includes Art and Design Day, takes place on November 8th. And it's a day for dedicating to promoting and celebrating education and careers in these fields. It aims to inspire students and professionals to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and to highlight the importance of these disciplines in our society. In honor of National STEM STEAM Day, we wanted to focus November's podcast episode on discussing the importance of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the boiler industry. For example, engineers working in the boiler industry use principles of physics and thermodynamics to design and optimize boiler systems. They also apply mathematical concepts to analyze and troubleshoot boiler performance. Furthermore, advancements in technology such as computer-aided design, CAD software, and automation have, have revolutionized the boiler industry, making processes more efficient and cost-effective. This highlights the importance of technology in the boiler industry and the need for professionals with STEM and STEAM backgrounds to drive innovation. Additionally, incorporating art and design principles into the boiler industry can lead to more aesthetically pleasing and user-friendly boiler systems. For example, design can create visually appealing and ergonomic boiler controls that improve user experience. So today on this episode, we celebrate STEM Day. We aim to inspire the next generation of welders and engineers to consider a career in the boiler industry. Join us as we explore the connections between STEM and STEAM and the world of boilers and how these fields are shaping the future of our industry. On today's episode, I'm excited to be joined by two amazing individuals from our industry. First up, we have Katie Van Warmer, an engineer specializing in hydronic boilers with 12 years of experience. She's the director of hydronics at Cleaver Brooks and will discuss how her background in engineering has shaped her career in the boiler industry and the exciting opportunities available for young professionals looking to enter this field. Our second guest, Stephen Taylor, Vice President of the Rental Division at Ware, has over 40 years of experience in the boiler industry and started his career as a welder. He will share his insights and expertise on how welding plays a critical role in keeping boilers operating efficiency, efficiently. Now, let's get into the conversation and discover the exciting possibilities that await in the boiler room. So without any delay, I will bring in Katie and Steven. Hi, Katie. Hi, Steven. Hello. Hey, thanks for joining us today. And Glad welcome. To be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, um, I wanted to start out by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about your background in welding or engineering and how you got started in the boiler industry. Katie, let's start with you. Sure. So I did. I have been in the boiler industry for about 12 years. I started uh, specifically in the boiler industry as an outside sales rep selling Cleaver Brooks equipment. Uh, I did that for about five years before I joined Cleaver Brooks um, as a product manager for condensing hot water boilers. Um, starting my, indus my industry experience, though, actually right out of college and even when I was in college, I worked for a consulting engineering firm doing mechanical design for uh, HVAC piping and sheet metal systems. So sizing equipment, uh, doing CAD drawings and um, you know things at, at the job sites and stuff like that. And then I kind of got more specific into the boiler industry about six years after that. Okay. And what keeps you passionate about working in this industry? Because I know being a, an engineer and in the boiler industry as a female, it's it's a unique opportunity. It is a unique opportunity. Um, something that keeps me interested is really looking at different projects and different systems. Every single building that I get involved in, boiler selections, looking at new construction projects or retrofit projects, everything is a little bit different or there's different customer needs or different systems that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, so really the variety and trying to figure out what makes the most sense for that application and that customer. Um, or if I'm troubleshooting a system and trying to figure out what's going on, you know, playing a 
detective a little bit to see what's happening and how do we resolve those issues and you know make the system work well for the customer with boiler replacements or upgrades or things like that. Great. Steven, what, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, so I uh, started um, actually part-time for where when I was working as a steel fitter at Jeff Boat over in Indiana, uh, my brother was already working for where, so I was working at nights and on the weekends helping to build temporary boilers. I was welding, blow down piping, feed water piping, uh, steam piping, because I took welding in, in trade school uh, for two years when I, when I was in high school. Um, so I started out there and, and then um, when Jeff Boat laid everybody off, I, I got a job full time at, at where started out as a welder, became a certified welder. And then a couple of years later, took the shop supervisor's job. Um, and then in that was in uh, 82 when I started. So I've been been here for a minute or two. <laughs> then in in uh in 88 I, I moved into rental sales and then in 91 i took over as the um director for sales for the entire company in 96 i moved into um the uh, position of director of sales for the rental and special projects the equipment division um so that's 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 been my history i, I started out as a on the ground floor is about as, as low as you can get and just kept my nose to the grindstone and built myself up from there. Wow. And, you know, I'll come back to you. What keeps you passionate about Because you've been around a long time. <laughs> I have. And being in, you know, running the rental division is, is completely different in that every day we're doing calculations and engineering and, and sizing for, you know, somebody calls in and they say they need a 30,000 pound per hour boiler. Then we start asking questions. Okay. You need a temporary boiler. How long do you need it? What's your operating pressure? What fuel? What 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 you know? What utilities do you have? And, and what makes you think you need a thirty thousand pounder? Where that number come from? Well, that's the size of our board. Okay. Do you mm -hmm. have steam flow meters? Yeah, we do. Can you give me a chart on the steam flow meters? How long are you going to need it? And then we find out. Well, they don't need thirty. They only need ten. And then so so we we develop a solution for them instead of just giving them what they ask for. We, mm -hmm. we develop a solution and it's something different every day of the week. It, it's, it, you know, and we're, it's 24 seven. It, it, we may get a call at two o'clock in the morning. The hospital's lost their boiler. They've got to have something right now. So it's, it's, that's what keeps me running and keeps me going. Every day is different. Well, and it sounds like both of you, even though we're lock, we're looking at two different areas within our industry, I'm hearing similarities between you both, you know, ever changing you're trying to solve problems new things every day and that's that's a that's to me that's interesting about our industry is there is you know different solutions to different problems and things keep popping up so um let's talk about the actual science technology engineering and mathematics how did these areas play roles in your day-to-day -day work with boilers katie I'll have you go first. Sure. So uh, as far as the STEM um, side of things go, you know, in my day to day work, I, I kind of do two different types of engineering, although my current role, I'm not as specific in uh, very detailed engineering calculations, but I do get involved both with our product development and R&D teams. So looking at product engineering, what are the components? Um, what do we need to be developing and working on to meet market requirements, meet our customer requirements? Um, so the product engineering level is one component, which gets into combustion, heat transfer, controls, electrical, all of the things that go into our products. And then on more on the customer side of things, working on what I'll call application engineering or system engineering, where we're applying those products into uh, customers' systems. So looking mm -hmm. at, like Steve mentioned, you know, voltages, gas pressures, supply temperatures, um, pressures, if it's steam, you know, things like that. Um, and then doing the engineering, you know, getting into sizing piping, expansion tanks, if we're getting into the system <coughs> side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so really kind of two different facets, I think, to the, the engineering that I'm doing now is on the product side, also on the system side too, which is one of the things that helps with that variety that we both mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Stephen, what about you with the STEM as far as your day-to-day -day work with the boilers? I've got two different facets that I work with. One is designing uh, rental equipment. Mm -hmm. So we're always trying to build something bigger, get more capacity out of the same footprint. So I'm working with the, the manufacturers on, you know, 
what can we do to re reduce emissions? What can we do to reduce the footprint and add fins to the tubes? Do different things where I can get more capacity out of the same footprint so I can mm -hmm. still move the bore down the road. Um, and, and so that's that's what I do on the front end and then helping to design the the rental units themselves and, and building the, the, you know, the thousand horsepower, the 650 horsepower, whatever they are, to get them in a trailer where I can move them down the road. And then on a day to day basis, it's again, just providing solutions and working through calculations and formulas with customers on, OK, um, I've got 400 feet of gas line to feed this, you know, 100,000 pound per hour boiler and I've got 65 pounds of gas pressure. What size gas line do I need to run? OK, how many 90s do you have? How many T's do you have? Going through all those calculations. So we, we do that pretty much on every rental boiler we put out. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, every day we're doing calculations for somebody on something. And it's it's not something, you know, that you can um, get from, a, you know, from a book. Most of this is um, ground level stuff. You, you have to have the experience of being able to do it every day because of, you know, if they're let's take a water line, for, for example, if, if they're going to run that 100 feet up a building over top of the building, then you have to take into account the lift of that that rise over the building to get your head and uh, feet pressure on that pump so you can pump it. Just different things like that you have to really take into account and you don't know what the questions to ask until you've been on the on the street and been in the customer site to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting. Um, Katie, yeah. with engineering, it can be complex and highly specialized, just as both of you have mentioned. Um, what does a typical day look like for you as a hydronics and an engineer? And tell us some of your challenges and some of the rewards in this field. Uh, sure. So in my day-to-day -day, um, job, I'll say, you know, usually more if I'm traveling or out on the road is typically when I'm getting, if I focus kind of more on the system engineering side of things, mm -hmm. um, being able to visit with our representatives and their customers, you know, going out into boiler rooms and figuring out, like I mentioned, how to solve some of the problems that they have and applying okay. You know, even if you're not doing specific engineering calculations, you're applying that methodology to doing a boiler room evaluation or looking at, um, like Steve mentioned, you know, asking different questions on, um, you know, where are you getting your feed water from or where is your gas coming from? You kind of have that process and procedure to go through, which is just kind of that analytical engineering brain is having that process to go through and do that evaluation. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Steven, for those interested in the trades and working on the shop floor, what opportunities are available? And for those interested in getting to wel into welding, what specific skills or certifications do they need? And what does the path look like for that individual to get into welding? Yeah, typically with, with, with our business, because we're a repair business and we do a lot of installs, but most of our stuff is repair work mm -hmm. um, in, in, in lieu of manufacturing. We, we train those guys, you know, OJT on the job. So we, we and our, our right now, our best group of people we're bringing in is farm boys. They're accustomed to getting up at 430 in the morning, going milking the cows, taking care of the hogs, whatever they're doing. They're accustomed to working long days and keeping their nose to the grindstone. You don't have to have any uh, specific mechanical skill to be very, very good and to enjoy a great life. Typically, we want we want kids right out of high school. We, we don't want a college kid to, to, go, to be a welder and, and not because they don't have the skills, because the skills they have are more um, behind a computer screen, doing something like that. They're not accustomed to, nor do they want to work with their hands. Mm -hmm. And we can bring a guy in and, and, and you know, within about four years, a welder in my business can maybe make it 150 grand a year. Wow. With no college education, just bring him off the street, bring him in. You just need a good work ethic, be able to be a little bit mechanically inclined. And we, we've got a spot for you. We can train you to do anything you want to do. Right. I have, that's, that's great. So I know I'm sure both of you with all your years of experience probably have some advice for those interested in pursuing careers in either welding or engineering in the boiler industry. Kitty, can you share first with us what advice you would give? Sure. Um, coming from, you know, I did mechanical engineering in college uh, at Michigan Tech. And uh, one of the things with going to college, especially mechanical engineering programs, is a lot of time is spent focusing on um, 
I see engines and parts and kind of like the glamorous side of engineering. A lot of people think mechanical engineering and they think cars or trucks or whatever, you know, things that are more interesting. I think sometimes or that's like the first thought people have when they think mechanical engineering, but really the construction industry, um, looking at building design, which is how I got into the industry, you know, that a lot of mechanical engineers doing that. And then you get into equipment engineering and application. And there are so many different ways to apply a mechanical engineering degree that like engineering a car part has no interest for me at all. I've never been interested <laughs> in doing that, but I was relatively good at math. And then I kind of got into the building side of things. And I, I like the architectural nature of consulting engineering and then made my way more into the boiler side of things. But if you're looking at an engineering degree, I think being a little bit more open-minded about all of the different possibilities that there are. Um, mm -hmm. And in the construction industry, you know, you could work for a contractor and do project management or do things on job sites or be in an office or some hybrid approach. So I think just keeping an open mind, if you like engineering and like that analytical approach, there are a lot of different ways to apply an engineering degree once you get into the real world, not just necessarily automotive engineering, which is, I think, what a lot of people think um, mm -hmm. initially anyway. Right. And I feel like that's part of our mission is a lot of people don't know right away about the boiler industry. As you mentioned, you kind of slowly made your way there. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's that way, not only for the engineers, but also for the trades. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've gone to, to some of the welding schools and you have welders who are about to edu graduate and they've never even heard of us. They don't even yeah. realize that we exist. Right. So I do think some of it is just getting out there and having more information available about, about our injuries industry. So people realize that, that it is an area they could pursue from yeah. the beginning. Um, yep. Stephen, tell us your advice in pursuing in, in a career in our industry. <clears throat> just, uh, you know, find out what your passion is and, and, and follow the, you know, follow your nose. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm very, very competitive. Um, I'm very aggressive in, in everything I do. Uh, it, it, and if, if you have that mindset, which I did, my, you know, I, I was one of 10 kids in my family. So the only way I could stand out was to try to beat my brothers, five of them, uh, to anything we were doing. So mm -hmm. I always try to be in front, try to run faster, try to, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whether we're walking down the street, I want to be, be in front. Uh, that, that's the way I'm wrapped. And, and you don't have to be wrapped that way. You just need to put your nose to the grindstone and decide what you want to do. And just, again, be passionate about it mm -hmm. and, and run with it. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, find something you do enjoy and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. the, the boiler industry has so many different avenues for people to have an excellent career. And, mm -hmm. and you can start out like I did, start out as a welder and, 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 and push you can be anything you want to be. You can be running the company. You can be a CEO. You can be a, an entrepreneur and start your own business. Um, mm -hmm. But just get in, get into the business on the ground floor, decide what you want to do and run with it as hard as you can run. Mm -hmm. And I do know some uh, who have started out like helping with service. They got really good at service and then they started their own service company. Mm -hmm. So that is a whole nother area of our industry that is out there as well. Katie, what are some of the exciting projects you've worked on? I'm sure in your 12 years, you've seen a lot of different things. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 12 years is boilers. Overall, it's probably closer to 20 years. But uh, so I've done, you know, when I was do back doing consulting engineering, I got a variety of pr different projects. Um, one of the coolest ones was actually doing the renovation of the Mirage Volcano that's on the Las Vegas Strip. Um, cool. They were redoing all of the effects and the music and the lighting. And so the engineer I worked for, um, was the engineer of record. We didn't do like the um, actual features work, but we were the engineer of record for the project and we did all the support services. Um, so I got to go do field work in and on the Mirage Volcano um, mm -hmm. in July in Las Vegas, which is a horrible time to do that. Um, but that was a really cool project. Um, and then I worked on a variety of hospitals, which is, are always interesting because you have, you know, operating rooms and just a bunch of different things to deal with, med gases and stuff. Um, and then the Notre Dame Hockey Arena was another really cool one um, that I did all the mechanical design for that. Um, that was my first Revit project too. It was right when Revit was starting. Um, so it was all 3D and that was new and exciting also. Um, on the boiler specific side of things, um, growing up in Detroit, Michigan area, 
big Red Wings fan. They're, you know, big when I was growing up. Um, worked on the Little Caesars Arena, um, sold the boilers for that project. Um, and then just worked on a lot of big manufacturing sites with General Motors and some other neat, you know, kind of innovative or um, manufacturing facilities that maybe you don't always see how things are made. And then you get to go in and see kind of mm -hmm. all that's involved with what everyday products and how they're actually made. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Steven, yeah. welding is a critical part of manufacturing. What's one aspect of welding in our industry that you think people will be surprised to learn about? Um, think about that earlier in the background picture you have there, that's a tube sheet with tubes, uh, there and they're seal welded. And most people think that that weld is actually sealing the tube when it's not. That weld is strictly there for heat transfer. So all it's doing is transferring the heat from the end of that tube to that tube sheet. So you don't burn that, that tube up with the hot gases that are in that turnaround on mm -hmm. the back of that bar. Uh, and I still have to work with welders, you know, on a monthly basis where one of our welders will try to build the weld up because it's leaking. The weld is strictly there for heat transfer. It doesn't seal anything. It's not going to hold any pressure. The, mm -hmm. pre the, the seal is from rolling that tube into the tube sheet with a mechanical roll. That's what does it. And most people don't understand that. And it's, it's pretty unique in this industry that a weld is not there to, to hold pressure. It's there strictly as heat transfer. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask, what is like probably one of your coolest or worst projects you had to deal with? <laughs> uh, we've, I, I've been in, you know, because I've been here for 42 years. So I've been in several. One, one cool one, we, we, uh, we loaded two 75,000 pound superheated boilers onto an airplane, an Antonov uh, AN 124, and flew them from Louisville, Kentucky to British Columbia. So we mm -hmm. had 238,000 pounds of cargo on that wow. airplane. And, and it, Unique thing, it takes 10,000 feet of runway for that, that uh, airplane to take off. You got to need two miles to get off the ground. So we're, you know, we're sitting out there watching it take off and, and it's way down the runway and it's not even coming off the ground yet, which you need to pick it up, but, but you need to pick it up. You, you got to get up there. <laughs> that was a real cool one. It worked on um, New York City Housing Authority when, when, when Sandy came through, we put 24 rental boilers up there. And, and I spent months up there installing, operating, doing that. That was a cool project. Uh, we had another, another project where we sold a 250,000 pound per hour Cleaver Brooks boiler, uh, and we had to move it down a highway on a, on a, on a, uh, a, a go hoffer, which is a nothing more than a big trailer that's got a bunch of wheels on it that's self propelled. And we had to shut the highway down. So we had like seven miles of highway. We had to shut down with state police where well, we moved this this board and the highway because it's 25 foot wide and 27 foot tall. So you can't just wow. take it anywhere. So that was, that was a cool project. So we've, I've been in a bunch of them. I could talk about them all day. Oh, I'm sure. But we can't talk about fishing. That's not allowed. Yeah. This time. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that for a week. So we, we got to stay away from it. <laughs> yes. Well, we've looked at kind of your careers and some things in the past, but let's look at the future. How do you see the boiler industry evolving in the future? And what opportunities do you see for upcoming generations and how can they grow within the field? So Katie, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, so first up, I think, you know, something that's big and that we're all facing is, you know, decarbonization and electrification in our industry. So looking at different ways to um, produce energy, not like using fossil fueled um, equipment on job sites, which is a big change for a lot of us and how we're going to adapt to that. Where does the power come from? Where does the upsized electrical service come from? There's a lot that goes into uh, looking at decarbonization and how we're going to achieve that and still meet the demands of the customers and the buildings that need to be heated or cooled. Mm -hmm. um, and then going into the future, I think something in this industry uh, is it's, I think the boiler industry is often perceived as being a little bit antiquated or not very not a very glamorous industry to be in, like where it's not like showy and um, maybe like some of the other ones, but looking at, you know, there is a lot going on here with different controls technologies and controls are really differentiating a lot of our products now and how um, how they interact with the customer and getting into AI and, and IoT and all of that. So I think that evolution is just going to continue to happen. And then it's always great to see more women entering this industry too, something that you know, it's going into mechanical engineering, there aren't very many women and then getting into the boiler industry, there are even less women. So I think, you know, anything we can do to promote that and promote women getting in, into the industry is great as well. I agree. That's why we started Wibby. <laughs> 
All right, Stephen. So let's see. What are your thoughts on um, evolving technologies and um, and opportunities for upcoming generations? Yeah, we, we just went through this um, a few weeks ago in, inside of the company, and you know, steam is going to be here forever. There's not another median uh, that can transfer heat the way steam can, so it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Hydronic water, it's not going anywhere. It's going to be here. It's going to continue to expand. The way we generate both hot water and steam, that's that's going to that's going to change. The you know the whatever we're using for whether it's um, hydrogen for for gas, whatever we're using, uh, renewables, all that stuff. But the 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 system itself, the steam and the hot water, that's not going to change. We're still going to be using steam and hot water to do the the work we're doing today. Um, but the the you know emissions reductions, all of the other things that are taken into place. Mm -hmm that's going to change how we're generating that steam and how we're generating power. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a huge challenge for the, for the industry. Uh, I mean, it, you know, in 2012, the U S uh, built 1,750 miles of new transmission line and 2019, they, they built, you know, 15 miles. So they're going backwards from where we need to be. We need to be building 2000 miles a year and we're building nothing for the most part. So they're, there's a huge challenge in the industry and, and, and in, in our industry, uh, we, it's going to continue to grow. Uh, you know, 80 percent of the boilers in the United States are 40 years old or older. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge challenge for the boiler industry to, to, to build that and replace all that that power equipment. And I do feel like in the last, I don't know, 10 years, we've seen a big increase in um, alternative fuels, alternative energy. And that seems like Katie mentioned, it seems to be you know, continuing. And the other big one is the AI. I mean, I just saw an article the other day about AI for the boiler controls and things like that. So um, do you guys, are y'all seeing more of the AI in the boiler room? And how is that, you know, how are you seeing that apply to our industry? I don't honestly have a whole lot of experience with AI specifically. It's something we, you know, we're talking about. We have our Prometha, our IoT internet solution. I'm not mm -hmm extremely involved in that, to be honest. So I, mm -hmm. I know about it from like a market perspective, but um, I like everything else, you know, everything now seems like it's connected and you're getting all this data and, you know, mm -hmm. I see it, you know, from a customer perspective, hopefully moving towards things that are helping the customer ultimately operate their equipment better with preventative maintenance and making sure the equipment is running as efficiently as pop possible, optimizing, you know, the, um, runtime and you know things like that so i mm -hmm. i certainly see it becoming more ingrained in what we're doing mm -hmm. and you steven are you seeing anything with the alternative fuels or the ai the, al the alternative fuels we're seeing seeing a lot of movement in um, the ai um, that's going to be interesting because there's mm -hmm. a, a lot of possibilities there but you know how much people like you know csd1 and and those guys how much they're going to let ai get involved Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to see how that pl plays out because they've got a lot of safety concerns and AI, if you let it get involved, it'll do whatever you want it to do. Right. So that, that's, that's going to be interesting to see how that evolves over the next few years. It, no it, doubt. I agree. Well, let me, let me end with this last question. How can we inspire and encourage more young people to consider careers in STEM and steam fields, specifically in the boiler industry? Katie, I'll let you finish. I think just, promote, figuring out how to promote it a little bit more, even at the, the high school level, you know, when you're doing, you know, chemistry and physics and, you know, kids are starting to look at where they want to go to school and what they want to do. It's kind of this black hole of, you know, a field where you don't really hear a whole lot about it unless you kind of stumble across it. Like I grew up, my dad was a boiler rep for 45 years or, or so before he retired. So I kind of grew up with boilers and mm -hmm. was familiar with it. But, you know, if you don't grow up with it, you know, getting into the industry is kind of you, you might stumble across it, I guess, or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of get into it. Um, so I think promoting it more at job fairs and career fairs and, you know, getting to the younger engineers or younger people sooner, just so that they're more aware of what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. I agree. And Stephen, anything on your, uh, from you on this? Yeah, it's. It, I agree with Katie. It, it's um, you know the the boiler industry is looked at like a, a blacksmith business. It, you know, it's dirty. It's you know, it's cold. It, it's it's forty year old 
um, uh, impressions that people still have. And so that's one you know thing that that Richie and Brent do a good job of of promoting what what Steam does and, and you know the the boiling points and the uh, Steam culture to to you know educate people. And and we've we've got a big hurdle ahead of us. We need to educate people about what steam and hot water does, what happens if you don't have steam and hot water. I mean, mm-hmm. you, we don't have clothes. We don't have a desk. We don't have this computer. Toilet None paper. <laughs> you don't, no, yeah, you don't have any of that without steam. because steam. Amazon touches, boxes. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 everything. You just look right. around. Anything you look at, your cell phone, you don't have it if you don't have steam. So, and, and we're just, we've done a real poor job. And, and there's a lot of us, you know, where and CB and, and uh, ABMA are working together to, to put programs together to promote this. We just have to do a lot more of it. I agree. And that will be an initiative um, for ABMA in the future, near, very near future, actually. Well, Katie and Steven, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your background and your insights on careers in our industry. Overall, STEAM and STEM Day can serve as a reminder of the critical role that science, technology, engineering, arts, and, and mathematics play in the boiler industry to drive innovation and advancement in our industry. And we hope this podcast episode will encourage individuals who pursue these careers to consider joining our industry. Um, I wanted to also say stay tuned for more episodes of Inside the Boiler Room. Follow us on YouTube and like us on your audio podcast platforms so you don't miss any future episodes. And we also have um, a large LinkedIn following, but also we have a private Wibby Women in the Boiler Industry group that you can look us up on LinkedIn and be part of that. And it can be for men or women. Um, And also, I would encourage you to visit abma.com for more insights on the boiler industry and sign up for our boiler weekly newsletter. You can also connect with us on our other social media platforms as well. I will see you next time. Thank you, everyone.